good morning, good morning. Okay, let's do this. October 27th. Happy Thursday in our Lord Jesus. Uh-oh. I probably did that on the mouse pad. Well, y'all don't know what I did, but the screen changed. I had my book propped up a little bit, so I'll be more careful, maybe. So today we're talking about the gospel of old. The best news ever, right? The greatest story ever told. The truest story ever told. The best true story. On and on and on. It is the good news that brings the dead back to life. So in 2 Corinthians 5.1, it says, We know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. This tent, this earthly house, that sounds like your your home, right? Or maybe your church building. Um, but I believe he's talking about your body. There's other places in the Bible where it's called a tent, your dwelling place, because your soul is the eternal part, right? So, 2 Corinthians 5.1, let's see what Billy Graham has to say about it. My wife, Ruth, walked with me along the path of life for 64 years. She was the most godly woman I have ever known. She followed Christ along the pathway he marked out for her with grace and dignity. And she smiled through the journey, good or bad. When Ruth was separated from her pain-stricken body and her earthly construction was complete, she found peace. No doubt about it. My wife loved old things. They represented character and survival. This love for the old her, made her treasure childhood memories from China. When Ruth died, the family had the Chinese character for the righteousness, for righteousness engraved on a very old stone. She had looked forward to the day she would stand before the Lord, having awakened to righteousness. As Christians, we can look forward to standing in the righteousness of Christ because good news is the gospel of old that is from the beginning and will endure forever. But the righteous has an everlasting foundation. Proverbs 10, 25. What does scripture say about righteousness? Um... I see sometimes I wonder, is he talking about just what we could derive from his little thing here? Or is he telling us to go dig deeper? Um, and then I think, well, maybe I should start preparing more. Good morning. Um, but I'm going to say what I do know off the top of my head is that our own righteousness that we have without him is filthy rags before him. Like, it's impossible in and of ourselves to be righteous. But... He gives us his righteousness as he covers us with his, with his blood. When he cleanses us with his blood, um, we appear righteous before the Father as he is righteous. When we stay near him, when we stay filled, excuse me if you saw my nose here, I had to shift around a little on the couch. Um, when we stay filled with his Holy Spirit, and we walk in his spirit and in righteousness and truth, um, it is who he is. So if we're full of it, then it's going to be who we are too. Can More and more every day, more and more as you draw nearer and grow in Him. So, let's go look at 2 Corinthians. The filthy rags, um, you know, He traded His righteousness for our sins. We get to claim His righteousness because He seated us in heavenly places with Him. And because, you know... That was the whole point. That was his point in coming, was that we might be counted worthy through his blood, through his sacrifice, um, to be in the presence of the Lord. So 2 Corinthians 5. For we know that if our earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal dwelling in the heavens, not made with hands. Indeed, we groan in this tent, desiring to put on our heavenly dwelling since when we have taken it off we will not be found naked Ooh. 
Indeed, we groan while we are in this tent, burdened as we are, because we do not want to be unclothed, but clothed, so that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who prepared for us, who prepared us for this very purpose in God, who gave us the Spirit as a down payment. So the Spirit is our insurance that we are going. That's the down payment on the full um, reward that we're going to receive in heaven, the full gift that we're going to receive in heaven. Um, all of those things. The Spirit, and that's how you know. That's how you know that you know is the Spirit's within you, is that you are growing closer to Christ, that you are growing more like Him, that you are walking in the Spirit and abiding Him and turning your back on the things of the world and um, seeking Him. The Spirit is the proof, the down payment. You make a down payment on something that you're buying. And He bought us and He sent His Spirit as the down payment to prove to us that we are bought, that we are His. The Spirit identifies with the Spirit. So we are always confident and know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. In fact, we are confident and we would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Because this flesh is corrupt. It is corrupt. That's the separation um, that the Word makes clear. You know, the the word is described in the word as um, a double-edged sword that divides bone from marrow, spirit from soul, um, and exposes the truth. And that's part of the division, the flesh from the spirit. In fact, we are confident and we would <laughs> prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Amen. I read that one already. And it bears repeating. Amen. Therefore, whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to be pleasing to him. That part. Make it your aim to be pleasing to him. Even while you're stuck in this crummy flesh, there's so many ways you can deny this flesh. No, you're not going to like it. It's not going to be what you're comfortable with. It's not going to be what you prefer. But that spirit, that freedom in your spirit, knowing that you are doing your all to please the Lord, it will more than suffice. It will more than satisfy. It will more than comfort you in the ways that you are in discomfort in your, sp in your body, in your flesh. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Whether good or evil. Therefore, since we know the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade people. And you know, that's the only thing. I think, I'm sure I've said it before. And we'll continue. There's no one else to fear. There's nothing else to fear. But the Lord and a healthy fear of Him. Um, what is it? The beginning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, I believe. Or knowledge. Which knowledge leads to wisdom. So either one. Either one makes sense. And is applicable and is, you know, um, makes sense. <laughs> I said that. So, therefore, we know the fear of the Lord. We try to persuade people. We don't want them. We want them to know the fear of the Lord, too. We want them to have this blessed assurance, too. And it's linked. It's linked to so many things. It's linked to loving Jesus and therefore keeping his commandments. It's linked to those who, these signs shall follow those who believe. Not just those who believe and decide to be a preacher. Not just those that believe and go to seminary. Not just those that, you know, believe and become an evangelist. But those that believe, all of those that believe. Good morning, Miss Sherry. Hey, sister. Good to see you. Um... All those that believe. So, what we are is plain to God. And I hope it is also plain to your consciences. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to be proud of us 
so that you may have a reply for those who take pride in outward appearance rather than in the heart. Yeah, because that outward appearance is not going to last. There's Elijah. Good morning. That outward appearance is not going to last. It's going to burn. It's going to fade. It's going to rot. It's not going to last. So that soul, that inward, um, that inward truth, that inward you is the one that is eternal. For we, wait, for if we, wait, is that where I got to? I'm sorry, I'm everywhere this morning. For if we are out of our mind, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. That. And we're not to be for you. We're to be for the Lord. So, um, yes, I'm crazy. I'm crazy for the Lord. Um, it's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. And, you know, we should think about that when we look at one another and say, what is she doing over there? Well, if she's doing it to glorify God and it's according to his word, then praise God for her, even if it seems crazy to your flesh, right? If we are out of our mind, it is for God. And if we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us since we have reached this conclusion. If one died for all, then all died. And he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. Yes, live for Jesus. We're not supposed to live for ourselves anymore. And that doesn't mean just saying, I belong to Jesus, and then doing what you want. It doesn't mean just every morning I'll say, I'm going to come on here, and I'm going to be loving and encouraging. <laughs> and then I get on here, and um. But, you know, this has to be said. People need to open their eyes. God is waking his people up. He is raising up a generation. He is raising up an army. Y'all, we are in the last days. It's time to quit playing with it. It's time to quit playing with it. It is time. Um, I'm reminded of a sermon I just listened to um, where the preacher said, you know, it's so quiet in the house of God, but you go to a ball game. Uh, especially if it's your child or your grandchild playing and you're screaming at the top of your lungs, you're hollering at the refs, you're, you know, um, praising that child, basically. Um, but then you get to the house of God and you're quiet. Or anywhere else you go, why aren't you praising God like you're praising those kids? Why aren't you screaming for the Lord? Because you know what? That praise, there's so much power in that praise and worship. Um, because that's what God desires. And when He hears it from you, from your heart, when he sees you um, join together, especially in one accord, praising him, he's going to move. He's going to be in the midst and he's going to move. So, he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And he's taught me this because I want to... Mm, I want to be lazy. I don't even want, in my flesh, I don't even want to leave the house, y'all. But God, but God, but God. He gave me some desires for my son and my family that make me want to do something different. For him and not for me. Because it's with his kingdom in mind and not with my little, you know, bubble in mind. Thank you, Jesus. So, from now on then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective, anyone according to the flesh. Even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, yet now we no longer know him in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. And see, the new has come. This is one of the ways that I knew, that I realized, um, I've been playing, you know, I've been just playing the role. And not even doing a good job at playing the role. My playing the role was claim it, name it and claim it, and still, still live for the world. Um, and this is one of the ways you know for sure. And it's also one of the ways you know for sure when you do get born again, when you immediately have a new outlook and an eternal perspective and you set your eyes upon him. You will know because you will be a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. Um, 
all things, all new things have come. Everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation. Um, there's not a footnote on that. There's some cross references, but those take longer. Because just to read that, I'm going to say that he reconciled us to himself through Christ, and our ministry of reconciliation is to, to lead others to do the same, right? To, uh, you know, to make it our business, to let it be known, the difference that has been made in us, why he is the way, the truth, and the life. You know, he proves it to us when he comes in and saves us and makes us a new creation. Um, and for those that can't just look and see, let them know, testify. Tell them how good your God is. That is, in Christ, God reckon, was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. And see, he repeats that. Let me look at the cross-reference real quick. Yeah, we're only 16 minutes in. There's only one, and it's Romans 5.11, which is just a couple books this way. Let's see what Romans 5.11 says. Do, 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 5.11. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received this reconciliation. And that takes you back to... Second Corinthians, but also Romans eleven fifteen. I mean, you know, the reconciliation is God created man and um, woman, and He walked with them in the garden every day, and then they sinned and fell from His graces, and passed that on to every generation, the fall of mankind into a sinful nature as in born to sin and I'm talking so much I forgot 11 what I was looking for 1115 um, you know and then he he see, he sent Jesus the plan from the lamb from the foundations of the earth um, to reconcile us to him, to make a way to bring us back into that fellowship with him, to tear that veil down out of the way and allow us to enter his throne room in the name of Jesus Christ, his son, our brother, in the gospel. 18. Do not boast that you are better than those branches, but if you do boast, you do not sustain the root, but the root sustains you. Then you will say branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. So he's talking about the adoption. How, you know, um, the original branches were Israel. But they rejected God. Um, rebelled, you know, etc. And so he said, okay, I've got something for y'all. I'm going to offer it to what they call the dogs. I'm going to offer it to... The Gentiles to everybody else and so he's saying you know don't brag about that the root sustains you you're just you're a branch too and those branches weren't broken off that you might be grafted in but since they were broken off you have been grafted in so if you go back up to 17 now if some branches some of the branches were broken off and you though a wild olive branch were grafted in among them and have come to share in the rich root yes of the cultivated olive tree, do not boast that you are better than those branches. So, you know, don't ever uh, think that you couldn't have been that Israelite that rejected God. Don't ever think that you couldn't have been Adam and Eve with that apple. That that same preacher I was talking about um, that said that about yelling at ball games and stuff um, also brought this point, you know, um, Oh, we wouldn't have been. How how could they eat that apple? He told them plainly not to eat not to eat of that fruit, and that's exactly what they did. Was went and ate of that fruit. Um. But yet, you know, we're hunched over our phone, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling every day, bowing down 
to that device that is taking precious time that can be in prayer, precious time that could be in the Word, precious time that could be witnessing, um, serving, you know, so many things. Um, we're bound down to it. So we're eating, we're taking a bite of that apple every day, right? And then Isaiah Saldivar, that's his quote. <laughs> Better give him credit where it's due. And then also, um, you know, he said, you want to say, oh, I'd be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, I wouldn't bow down either. But yet every time your phone rings, you're running to bow down over it and see, you know, what, what it's got to say to you, what it's got to show you. But anyway, so now, reconciliation. Okay, I was in verse 20. Let's get back to 2 Corinthians 5 and do the last couple of verses here. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not sin, did not know sin, to be sin for us. He literally took on our sins as his person that they could be crucified, that they could die with him. Our sin, in Jesus, our sin is dead to God. He doesn't see it. Those past sins, he doesn't see those anymore. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So that's where our real true righteousness comes from. The only real true righteousness is in Jesus um, to be sin to be a sin offering the footnotes say so see I went and looked all that up about the, the message of reconciliation and the ministry of reconciliation and then in the next two verses the Bible explained it for me and that happens all the time but it's still good to do that cross reference to see it in other contexts and get a better grasp that's why I love a good cross reference Bible so he explains it. We're ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. That is our ministry of reconciliation. God is appealing to others through us by us sharing our story, by us testifying of the goodness of God, you know, of how he has made us a new creature. You know, sometimes people will just ask, what girl, what got into you? You are not who you used to be. And you hurry up and tell them Jesus Christ, his Holy Spirit walks with me and leads me and has made me new reborn that I might become the righteousness of God so that is our ministry reconciliation pleading on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God that's in quotations that's that's what we're to plead to those um, that are lost we plead on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God and I plead on his behalf today be reconciled to God um, take the free gift that he has given seek him with your whole heart seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness I say that one every day don't I because it's like where it all begins if you seek him first then everything else is taken care of and it truly is but seeking him first is not always the easy thing it is usually not the easy thing but it is the one with the best reward, the highest payoff, the most beautiful eternal gift. And in the meantime, he does provide your every need. If you seek him first in all way, in all your ways, in all your endeavors, in all your jobs, in all your friendship, in all your travels, in every breath, seek the Lord. Seek him while he may be found. Tomorrow may be too late. Um, we're coming up on that day, and we're coming up on that day fast, so I'm excited. But at the same time, I want to take a lot of people with me. Amen? So anyways, you all have a happy uh, Thursday. I almost forgot what day it was. <laughs> I'm going to go get this little boy that's ignoring his alarm in here, and we're going to get rolling for the day. Praise God. Praise God. He loves y'all so much. He loves us all so much. Let's show him that we love him and let's keep his commands as he, as he prescribed. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. In Jesus' name. I'll see y'all tomorrow.